Hi there, welcome to Nepi Invest. This is my very first video for financial year 24. In fact, my last video for financial year 23, which I did release on Friday, the 30th of June, I mentioned in that video that it was the last day of the trading week, last day of the trading month, and it completely slipped my mind that it was the last day of the financial year. It wasn't only until just after I recorded the video that I realized, hey, it's also the end of the financial year. And just after I recorded the video and put it online, my chair completely collapsed. So apart from going for a long run, the first thing I did on the first day of the financial year 24 was buy a new desk chair. And it does cost a pretty penny. It was over $400, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, but totally worth it. Significantly better quality than my old chair, which I did have for about 12, 13 years. And this chair has a warranty of eight years. So hopefully, hopefully it uh, remains really good because I absolutely love this chair, even though I've only been using it for less than one a day. Now, in today's video, a technical update, we'll be going through some of the indices, the SEO, NASDAQ, Dow Jones. We'll also have a look at Bitcoin, then go through, look at some interesting charts on the ASX. This is individual companies. Also, a few overseas companies. Uh, when I say overseas, I mean listed on overseas company or overseas uh, exchanges, mostly, if not all, on the NASDAQ, or maybe the New York, New York Stock Exchange. But before we have a look at some charts, I do like to go through some of the interesting tweets I did find during the week. And when I say during the week, I'm talking about just before I record this video. This is a one week where I didn't do much twittering, twittering, going through tw I don't tweet at all, hardly any anyway. Uh, but I do go through Twitter and just have a look at what's happening out there. So let's start with one of my favorite tweets. And I always see this tweet on either a Saturday or Sunday. And this is from, um, who is this from? Um, investing, www.investing.com. When stock market closed on weekends, I am very similar to this guy, whoever it is. Seems like a drug dealer or something like that. Uh, and when the stock market is closed, I'm not like this. Now, I do do a fair bit of stuff on the weekends. For instance, uh, typically, either on a Saturday or Sunday when I'm not working, I will go for a long run. So I went for my long run on Saturday just before I bought my new chair. And this morning on Sunday, I took the dogs for a long three-hour walk. So I do like to get out there, particularly in mornings. In fact, I consider the mornings between about 5.30 a.m. and about 8 to 9 a.m. to be the best part of the day. I love being outside, uh, greatest part of the day. Uh, and it's really funny because... When I was at university, if I had a class starting at 9 a.m., it was way too early. And back in those days, I was more of a night person. I'd go to bed at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and wake up maybe 9 or 10 a.m. And I'm completely reversed now. I like to go to sleep earlier, say 9 p.m., wake up 5, 5.30 a.m. and get out there because, yeah, the dawn period is my favorite time of the day by far. And I understand the sentiment here. When the stock market is closed on the weekends, you know, what's there to do? Because I just love when the stock market's open. It's just, just me. I just love it. I love investing. Love when the stock market is open. I love reading announcements, that sort of thing. And I think a very important thing about life is just to find something you really love doing. And for those investors who don't love investing, don't love announcements, I think um, that's a, I won't say, I have an advantage over those type of people, but it is an advantage to actually be doing something you really like doing. Uh, and that's definitely true for work as well. So that's uh, yeah, investing.com. I always see this tweet every single weekend. And the next one was actually really interesting. This one, I just pause it here. So this is from a favorite of mine, uh, the Oklahoma, what was it? Oklahoma Department of Wildlife and whatever. And this just shows you how it, how important it is to keep an eye on young children. I think this is a two-year-old. This is on one of the lakes in Oklahoma, a fair few lakes in Oklahoma. And just look how quick it happens when a child just falls in the water, it's just so quickly. So let's go back to the start. You can actually see the child. There it is, the child. So quick. And fortunately, everyone reacted so quick and the child's okay. And then the camera puts down the camera because at this point in time, it's a child's safety is the most important thing. And if I remember correctly, two or three people jumped in the water 
uh, when this kid just fairly loose. Just kid has no idea, has no perception of what's around them and falls in. So and that's from yeah the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Con Conservation. If you uh, love Twitter, this is definitely um, a Twitterer to, uh, uh, what do you call it, like or, or follow, whatever you call it, um, because they also have really humorous tweets all the time. But this was just, just shows you, accents can happen fast. That's their, and it says almost drowning. Yeah, so congratulations to whoever said that child. Um, Tobias Carlyle, I've maybe I've mentioned him, this guy, one or twice. He's a value investor, uh, or even say deep value investor, and he does tend to be fairly bearish. And this is a thread he started on Twitter about one month ago, June the 7th. I'm starting a thread on recession indicators. It's fairly long. And if you are an ultra bear or like me, maybe you're more bullish over the long term and you want to get a, a counter ideas to your own thoughts. And I think that's very important. Just don't be locked in. Just don't have blinkers on uh, in regards to your thoughts uh, and look at different opinions, uh, particularly those opinions that are wildly different than your own, because I think you need to take on board people who are thinking differently than you. Uh, and one of my biggest problems in the world right now is people just gravitate towards those ideas that are very similar to those, and it just reinforces any mistakes, any problems they have uh, in those thoughts. Uh, it's a big problem in the world right now. Is that what we tend to do? For instance, on YouTube, if you're, say, an ultra-conservative, you'll just look at ultra-conservative um, YouTube people, and that would just reinforce your thoughts. So I'm not ultra conservative. I'm not ultra liberal, that sort of thing. I'm dead stuck in the middle. I like to take both sides of the stories. So even though I will look at a lot of bare uh, YouTube people, a lot of bearish uh, Twitter people, I always um, am mindful that there's always a different side of the story. But anyway, Tobias Carlyle tends to be a fairly bearish, I think, and there's a lot of interesting uh, things in here. For instance, the first and the motivating force for Tobias, Tobias Carlyle doing this particular tweet was from Don Johnson, um, logistics manager, talked about the implosion of activity in the freight sector. And I've heard this a lot over the past month, how freight in the United States has just absolutely collapsed. And this is a forward indication of potential problems in the economy when freight is really low. And that means nothing is being, no, no one's buying anything. That's probably the best way to put it. And it's actually lower now than it was during the COVID-19 financial panic. So um, that does look fairly bearish. Now onto CPI. So this is from Carl Cabalinga. I do follow this guy as well, because he's more of a technical analysis, definitely technical analysis. And uh, I do like what he has on Twitter. He does three webcasts or something during the week. Uh, and I do learn a fair bit from him. And this is not in regards to anything Carl has done. It's just the CPI numbers came out during the week and they were lower than expected, 5.6% versus 6.1 expected and 6.8 previously. So massively below forecast. And he also mentions here RBA a lock to pause at July meeting. And I think that's probably a pretty good or, however, who knows what the RBA is going to do, but uh, there's no reason for the RBA to be raising interest rates anymore. Uh, just pause and wait to see the effects of the high interest rates will have on the economy. And that just seems common sense to me and a lot of people out there. Uh, the first guy, uh, the first reply here, grateful Pelican, the economy is starting to creak, price drops and aggressive discounting to keep market share is a topic of conversation across retail. More slowdown down impacts to come. Pausing wouldn't be the worst call with strong hawkish language. Yeah, completely agree with that. Uh, so that's something interesting during the week. Uh, this is from Michael Cantor. I don't know much about this guy. He's sort of comparing 2023, 2000, and 2007, the pivot rally. So he's sort of describing what's happening now as a pivot rally. And what's happening in 2023. So what he's got here is the indices on the top part of the graph here. So we look at the NASDAQ, S&P 500, all those. And on the bottom is the 10-year yield. And 2023 is looking eerily similar than 2007. And we know what happened in 2008. The market's absolutely tanked. So in 2007, there was a nice rally in the NASDAQ 
and the other indices went nowhere. Um, so most of the heavy lifting on the NASDAQ was by a few companies. So I think he's saying or suggesting here that this is looking very similar to 2007. Not quite as similar as 2000, but sort of on the same uh, track. But um, this could be leading in to a significant decrease in the indices. So uh, moving into recession, that sort of scenario. And then this was, yeah, I was trying to understand this one. Uh, there was a lot of replies to this particular tweet from Bob Elliott in reply to another tweet from Nate Garaki. Uh, market action doesn't look like this when money is tight. It looks like this when the Fed is either tightening or is either behind the curve or actively stimulating. And there's a lot of replies to this. Um, looking at all these different information. Uh, and then there was this one reply, which I was trying to understand. I'm still trying to understand this one. Uh, I understand this one here. That's looking at the interest rates and the market. And the top of the interest rate cycle was coinciding with the top of the market. And then when interest rates started to fall, we saw the market absolutely collapse. And I've mentioned this a few times. Just before, just because interest rates will drop doesn't mean the market's going to go on the bull run. Uh, it has to do with the economy as well. And we have seen this happen a few times in the past when interest rates, because there's a lot of thoughts, a lot of belief out there that interest rates in the stock market and inversely correlated. So if interest rates go up, stock market goes down. If interest rates going down, stock market goes up. That's not always the case. And that's particularly true when I say it's not always the case. When we go into a recession, you sometimes will see, and a lot of times you will see, the stock market and interest rates go down at the same time. That's definitely true in the GFC. And that was definitely true in 2000 and 2001. And sometimes you'll even see interest rates go up and the stock market go up as well. Uh, anyway, another one from Cantor, and this is particularly true. Uh, why is employment so important this year? In fact, I'd say employment is always important. It's not, it's not really employment, it's unemployment. So a lot of times just before recession, just before we see the stock markets tank, you'll see unemployment reach a low. And then as soon as you see unemployment going up, that's when you see the economy and the stock markets in real trouble. Uh, so rising claims, so they're talking about unemployment, is the kiss of death for equities. And I have looked at the relationship between these two, and there is a fairly strong relationship between them. And that's what uh, Michael Cantro is talking about here. Uh, and this goes all the way back to 1965. So he's actually put a bear symbol showing where the bear market occurs. And that typically correlates, typically correlates with the bottom of the unemployment cycle. So when unemployment has reached a trough, that's when you see problems. When it starts going up, that's when you see problems. And right now we're probably at the bottom of that trough, potentially. But you could argue, you could argue with me, and you might be successful that this time is different, which is sort of this time is different. Worst four words you can use because now history doesn't often repeat, but it does often. History doesn't repeat, but it often does rhyme. But just because uh, population growth, that sort of thing, uh, just a lack of uh, new kids being born over the last 20 years, uh, it isn't causing, it will cause a significant issue. And a lot of baby boomers have retired as well. So even though I think we have, even though it does look like possibly we're at the bottom of the unemployment cycle, do we have enough people out there? Do we have enough people out there to uh, see a significant rise in unemployment? Uh, I think that's a big question. Just look at Australia. We have to get a lot of people to come into the country just to take all the jobs that are, have opened up or are still opened up. And that is that could be the saving grace for all of us, that we don't have enough people for all the jobs, and that might be true for the next year. So even though it does look like we are at the bottom of the unemployment cycle, the question is, will we see a significant uptick in unemployment? I am skeptical of that. Now on to John, uh, Michael J. Kramer. And funnily enough, uh, my um, grandmother's maiden name was Kramer, so there's a chance I could have been called Michael Kramer in an alternate universe. Now, I do follow this guy and I do get a lot of emails from him and he does some YouTube videos. So this is his June, this particular tweet, the June job report could push rates sharply higher. So have a look at that uh, video. Uh, he tends, tends to be 
uh, fairly bearish, but he also owns quite a few companies I own in America. So um, I forget what. Let's have a look. I'll click on his name. Yeah, so here we are. 41.1% of the S&P 500 gains came from Apple, Microsoft, and NVIDIA. He owns Apple and Microsoft. So a lot of what he owns, I also own. One of the things I actually do look at him, but he does tend to be fairly bearish, but I do like his videos. Um, anyway, well, Kramer. Uh, talking about uh, being an ultra, ultra bear, Jerry, three, Jeremy Grantham is probably the most ultra bear out there. And since I've been following him, He's always been bearish, uh, and this is from Wall Street Journal's uh, Grantham warns AI boom won't prevent market bubble market bubble from bursting. Now, I did try to look at that article, but it is behind a paywall. Uh, maybe there's some more sophisticated people out there who can get beyond paywalls, but it's not a surprise to see that Jeremy Grantham Grantham is an ultra bear, and it's not surprising to see this sort of article from Wall Street Journal. Um, probably th there was some good debate about this particular article on Twitter. Um, this is from Game of Trades. Longer term valuations don't look attractive. The S&P Composite Index trailing 10-year nominal earnings yield is fairly low right now. Funny reason is just before the COVID-19 financial panic, I actually paid off my mortgage. And one of the reasons I paid off my mortgage was this particular reason that the 10-year yields look really low and I probably would be more benefit more beneficial for me paying off my mortgage than investing for the long term because you know it's um it, my interest rates at that point in time forget how much they were they weren't fairly high four percent or so maybe even less than that but that's a real gain four percent right now uh, because if i hadn't paid off my mortgage my interest rates on my loans would be about seven percent so if um instead of investing you could put your money into your mortgage and that's a gain of 7%. That's the way to look at it. And that's why I paid off my mortgage in the start of 2020, just because of these 10-year, uh, possible 10-year forward-looking yields. They were fairly low. And so that's why, um, even right now, it's maybe not be, be looking that attractive to be investing in equity markets, just because uh, some of the valuations are still fairly high. So it makes all sense. Uh, now on to Lynn Olden. Um, so this goes back to 1948, looking at gross national income and um, gross or real gross domestic product. Pretty easy to see relationship between the two. And every single time we've had a recession, this goes back to 19, what did she say, 1948. Every single time we have seen real gross national or income uh, go negative, we have seen a real gross domestic product go negative, which is a technical recession, not a real recession in America because they have a little committee who decides if the country is in a recession. And it wasn't that long ago, was it last year, where, where we did see two quarters of negative gross domestic product uh, growth, whatever, in the United States, which was a technical recession. But because of really low unemployment, they said, well, the committee said, well, we're not really in a recession. Um, but this, Lynn Alden is just pointing out there, there is a relationship between the two, and we have never seen real gross national income go negative without a recession or a real gross domestic product decreasing. What does she say here? Going back to 1948, gross national income has never been negative on a year-over-year -year basis without it already being in a recession. If this one isn't, then it's a first. Now, this goes back to, when was this, June the 21st? Now, this is very relevant because if you look at what's happening here, trending in Australia, France riots, and there was another one, something about France earlier. France has fallen. That was the other one. So I noticed, yeah, I noticed trending was uh, France, France riots, France has fallen, all those sort of things. And then I remember this tweet. Uh, from Michael Aru, I can't even pronounce his last name. It seems that people in France and Germany collectively decided to lose weight, but seriously, anyone surprised about the rise of right and left populism? And this is just food consumption decreasing significantly in the past year in Germany and France. We're talking about 30-year uh, lows. So people aren't spending money on food because they have to spend the money on other stuff. So people are starving, that sort of thing. That's what he's implying here. 
and look what's happened in France today. Riots in France, although to be fair, uh, France or French people write about anything. I'm not exactly sure what this was. I was trying to go through it, but it was trying about a shooting or something. Um, but anyway, and uh, French president blames video games and social media for their social unrest lately after a police shooting reignites neighborhoods around Paris, France. So um, anyway, as I mentioned, French right in regards to anything. And that is why they have some of the best working conditions in the world, because they protest at the drop of the hat. And this goes all the way back to the French Revolution. Uh, so congratulations to them. They've got, you know, have a much better life. And I just wish Australians would protest a little bit more. Uh, and one of the reasons why we have very little wage growth right now is because we don't protest at all. And when we do protest, it's pretty weak and crappy. Anyway, that's all the tweets I have for today. Let's go have a look at the technical uh, analysis, update, whatever you want to call it. And first up is the SGO. A nice little week, nice little bounce after a bad week last week, but still there is no trend in the XJO. If you have a look at the weekly chart, it's right in the middle of the range. So it could go higher or lower from here. Seems like it's just going sideways. I think the market is just um, not sure, not sure if it wants to be bullish or bearish, which is a lot different than the NASDAQ. NASDAQ keeps on going, come on NASDAQ, keeps on going higher, higher. So after a bad week last week, it's gone on a nice little rally this week, and it's almost at the high, uh, almost above the highs we saw last week. When I say highs, I'm not talking about all-time highs. We're talking about last time the market or the NASDAQ was this high was way back in March of 2022. There is a bit of a resistance level right on this. So let's see this high here. So it's not surprising. That was a high back in March last year. Got to that level and then sort of um, fell away a little bit. But it was a nice little, um, what do you call that? Uh, a nice little dip, whatever you want to call this. Um, correction, short, very short-term correction. And then it zoomed up on the Friday. What was it up? 1.6% on Friday. So that might be telling us uh, there should be a good day on the ASX on Monday, tomorrow. And the Dow Jones. So a really good resistance level at 34,400. And the Dow Jones is right on that level, 34,407. So when I say level, I really look at these as zones, these resistance and support there is as uh, lines as zones, and it's in a resistance zone right now. The reason it's a resistance, look what's happened the last times, last one, two, three, four, five times it's got to this level. One, got very close here. Two, three, four, five, six times it's fallen back. So it needs to get above this level on strength uh, for me to be excited, excited about the Dow Jones. Uh, another one is Bitcoin. Got up to the highs we saw back in April, and it's just gone sideways. So support and resistance levels do work. Uh, it's all about psychology of the investor. And I'll probably even say that in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, there are way more traders out there who do look at technical analysis uh, because I've seen people just use technical analysis when it comes to cryptos. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, companies on the ASX, a lot more uh, investors out there who don't look at technical analysis at all. They just look at fundamental analysis. You can't say the same thing with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. So it's not surprising to see the, the price of Bitcoin just go sideways right on those highs we saw back in April at about 30 or just above $30,000. Uh, for those who don't know, and I have, don't think I've mentioned this, I actually do uh, own a little bit of Bitcoin just because of the possibility, just the possibility that this is a real thing. And if it is a real thing, uh, the price of Bitcoin would be significantly higher than it is now, if it's real. I don't know if it's going to be a real thing. Now onto some charts, individual companies. The first one here is Persis Mining. This was probably one of my favorite gold companies on the ASX. But for some reason, the market has absolutely fallen out of love with this company over the past two or three months. Share price of Persis has fallen from $2.50 all the way down to $1.65. But what's interesting is when you look at the weekly chart. So daily chart looks pretty negative, but when you look at the weekly chart, the one thing you'll notice here, so I've got here is uh, the moving averages. So the 75, was it 25, 75, and in between 20 and 25 and 75, I have it shaded. So when it's shaded green, that means it's in an uptrend. 
So because this is a weekly, this means we're talking about a longer term uptrend. So Persis, even though share price has fallen recently, uh, it's still in a longer term uptrend. In the short term, it's in a downtrend. In the long term, it's on an uptrend. Not only that, I've also included the 150 week moving average. And what has happened over the past few years, whenever the share price of Perseus has got to the 150 week moving average in March 2020, and also in September 2022, we have seen a nice little bounce. And the share price of Perseus is right on that moving average right now. So it doesn't mean we will see a bounce, but because it has happened twice in the past few years, there is potential we will see a bounce when it comes to Perseus. But again, this is a gold mining company. And because it is a gold mining company, the share price of the company is highly correlated to the price of gold. Get that in the back of your mind as well. But possibly a possible buy when it comes to Perseus. This company is a company I actually do own, Probiotic. And this is a classic case of a breakout. I think I've mentioned this once or twice. So if we look at the weekly chart here, share price of Probiotic had real problems getting above $2.50. So particularly when the share price got above $2.40, that was the time to sell and then buy in when the share price got below about $2.15. But you notice the lows kept on rising. That's actually a good sign. Uh, so less selling, uh, it all comes back to psychology. So less selling um, when the share price got lower and lower and more buying when the share price got lower and lower. But when share, whenever the share price got back up to, say, $2.40, $2.50, we saw some selling. Again, just psychology. So when the share price broke above, say, $2.50, that would be a breakout. And we saw that a few, about a month ago, I think. We saw that breakout on the 8th of May, 2023, share price up 6% on some okay volume. And then the share price kept going up. Share price came back down tested $2.50 and then bounced off again. So this is just technical analysis, doing what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to see a test of the old resistance level, which is now support. And the share price has gone back up to a long-term high, if not an all-time high. Oh, very close, very close to an all-time high. Oh, those highs we saw back in 2009 were very similar levels then now, yes, very similar levels. Uh, but that's uh, 14 years ago, whether there's any resistance now. Um, and the only reason there might be resistance is uh, technical. Someone using technical analysis, look in the weekly chart, they see that was the old highs and they think, wow, all-time highs for this company uh, or right on the all-time high, I'm going to sell at that all-time high. But so this company is profitable. Uh, I'm pretty sure they are dividend giving, even though I am a shareholder. I don't even know that. Dividend yield of 2.3%. Price earnings ratio, 15.8. Really nice growth in revenue. Year-on-year uh, -year growth, pretty nice growth. Revenue has gone from 66 million to 182 million. Profit of 13.7 million. A profit margin of 7.5%. Uh, this is in my long-term portfolio. I am not going to be selling this unless I see some problems with the business model. Next one is National Tire and Wheel. Wheel, not wheel as in W-I-L-L. -L. Uh, the main reason I just started to look or include this company in this video is just what's happened with the share price in the last few days. Share price has gone from about 50 cents up to about 60 cents, a nice little bounce. But we have seen this, these nice little bounces before. We saw one in June last year. See, share price went from $94 up to $1.19. Uh, fairly low volume but then pull back. So, and we saw one again in January this year, nice little run up in the share price. Uh, the only reason, the only reason I might get excited about this is if the share price can get above the moving average, the blue line, which is 100, 150 day. And this is the blue 150 day moving average is resistance level or resistance zone, whatever you want to call it for this county, because it had real tough time getting past that moving average back in July. And you can just see what's happened in the last few training days. Share price did get above that moving average for a very, very, very brief period of time. And then the share price pulled back. So the share price has pulled back from 61 and a half cents down to 57 cents. So a little bit of selling when the share price got above that level. Not only that, a lot of resistance moving forward for this company because share price has been a downtrend. So a lot of investors have bought in higher prices and they will want to sell out as the share price rises. Uh, again, it all comes back 
to psychology, psychology is very important. It's why technical analysis does work. Well, psychology of humans is a real thing. We tend to do stupid things, humans. Uh, Symbio, um, this is another one. Now, I haven't put any lines here. So we'll put a line right there for Symbio. This used to be my net phone, if I remember correctly. Uh, this used to be a model of a small cap company that had really good success, just continually growing their revenue. They used to do pennies 4Cs. If you look at their pennies 4C history, uh, the receipts just grew gradually over time. And the share price went into a beautiful uptrend because of that. Uh, a beautiful uptrend share price went from, say, 20 cents all the way up to a high of almost $7 over a seven year period. The company has definitely had problems over the past five years. Uh, profits grown have not grown. In fact, they've dropped. Yeah, so profits profits have dropped from 200, no, revenue have dropped from 220 million to 202 million. Profits have dropped from 12 million down to 6 million. So something has seriously gone wrong with his business. That's why you can see the share price absolutely tank it over the past year. But if you do look at the weekly chart, share price looks like it's trying to consolidate. Uh, and if I see the share price get above about $2.20, that could be a breakout in this company's share price. But I probably would prefer some better financials from the company. Now, a company I was thinking of taking a position in, but I never did, was Satire. And this share price of this company has just taken off in the last two weeks. It's gone from $1.90 all the way up to $3.10. Uh, really good volume as well. Really nice volume coming in. So obviously someone out there likes it. And we did see a breakout, sort of a false breakout above the resistance level at $3, I mean $2. And it sort of was going higher and below, above and below that resistance level for a little bit. And then it just went zoom up. Uh, I've been waiting for a bit of a back, uh, retracing the share price. Uh, back down to say two dollars and thirty cents. If I see a share price retrace to about two dollars and thirty cents, uh, that might be a little bit of a good move. You need to see share price pull back when you see such such an acceleration in the share price, but really good volume coming in, which is telling me more than likely there are fund managers getting excited about satire. But Mark Abbott, this company is one point two billion. Now this company has had really good revenue growth, so it's gone from twenty two point eight. 92 to $210 million in revenue over the past three years. So phenomenal growth in revenue, they're not quite profitable. They're on the possibility, be, on the path to becoming profitable on a continual basis. But um, just the valuation is my concern right now when it comes to satire. And if I did take a position in satire, it would just be a trade. And when I say trade, I am holding on to companies for quite a while. And those have been short-term trades and I've just kept on holding them because the share price keeps on going up. So I'm just waiting for a sign to sell in these short-term trades. And until I get that sign, these short-term trades have become more medium to long-term trades. Just waiting for the sign. SG Fleet is interesting because this is in a space where quite a few companies are going on nice runs. So Macmillan Shakespeare, uh, Smart Group, SIQ, uh, charts are looking pretty awesome right now. And I was just waiting for SG Fleet. So I have taken a position in this company, just waiting for that momentum in those other companies to flow through to SG Fleet. And possibly we are starting to see it in the past few weeks. However, just looking at the long-term trend. So if we just go to the weekly chart, the share price is still in a downtrend. And I need to see the share price get above this dashed line, which is the downtrend. So right now, that dash line is about $2.47. So this is me just taking, preempting the break in the downtrend just because of the momentum in the other companies. So um, I'm in the green line now. That's okay. Uh, but um, I have had problems in the past where I've gone a little bit too early. So this is a possible me going a little bit too early, not getting confirmation share price of this company has moved into a longer term uptrend. But again, I've mentioned the reason I've taken this position, and I think this is very important. Know why you've taken a position or why you sell, um, that sort of thing. So when I ever I take a position, I have always, always write why I've done it. And also what I'm looking at for a sell. For instance, if the share price of SG Fleet uh, goes back down to say $2 or something like that, uh, that would be a possible sell. 
Oh, we're talking about McMillan Trace Speed. That's actually next in the, next in the group. So the companies with, who are doing similar things, and this is the weekly ch chart for Macmillan Shakespeare. So even though the weekly chart looks pretty good, data chart looks really good. This is a beautiful uptrend, Macmillan Shakespeare. Price earnings ratio of Macmillan Shakespeare, 18.1. The, the PE ratio of SG Fleet is 10.6. Dividend yield for this one is 6.8. Dividend yield for Macmillan Shakespeare is 7.3. So higher, uh, higher dividend yield for Macmillan Shakespeare. You probably would argue with me successfully that Macmillan Shakespeare is a higher quality company out of the two. Uh, and I've always had a position in one of these companies, Smart Group, Macmillan Shakespeare, SG Fleet. There are risks to these companies because of possible government regulations. Um, but I believe this is an area, a sector that is ripe for consolidation, ripe for mergers and acquisitions, that sort of thing. We did see one with SG Fleet. They bought something. Uh, but I do expect more in the future because there are quite a few companies in this space. And I think we need to see the amount of companies sort of lower. Sort of what happened with the telecommunications industry back in, say, 2013, 2015, where there was a lot of consolidation and then only a few companies remained after that. So this is looking a pretty nice chart for Macmillan Shakespeare. Um, wow, look at that. Okay. So this is the weekly chart. Let's just draw a line right here, $18. So, so what's happened at $18? So the share price of Bermuda Shakespeare has had a lot of trouble getting above $18. We know that, just look at that. Back in 2013, got to $18 and then massive. So that was, I've already mentioned, the main risk in regards to these companies are government regulations. And that's why the share price of this company fell by 36% in one week. And that would have been on one day uh, because of a possible change in something. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what. But the main point here is just before that announcement or whatever it was, uh, the share price had reached $18, fell away. Share price got back up to $18 in 2017 and 18, and it couldn't get through $18. It tried on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks. It tried to get above $18 and failed. And now it's right on $18 again. So the question moving forward for McMillan Shakespeare, can it go above $18? If it can, all-time highs. And I'm not afraid to buy into a company at all-time highs. Um, so I put McMillan Shakespeare onto my watch list. Genus Plus, I'm pretty sure this is a infrastructure company, infrastructure services company. Newly listed in late 2020. I haven't done any research on this company. So they engage in a provision of power and telecommunications transmission and distribution infrastructure. It operates through the following segments. Power Lines Plus, Diamond, ECM, Proton Power. Power Lines Plus segment provides design, construction, and maintenance of overhead transmission and distribution lines. Uh, I'm pretty sure the company is profitable. Nice growth in revenue. Revenue has grown from... Uh, we'll say $99 million in 2019 to $450 million in 2022. Fairly low margins, 3% profit margin. But profits in the last year were almost $14 million. Markup is almost $200 million. So the price earnings ratio, 18.8, 18.1. But uh, the main thing, the reason I've uh, included Genus Plus in this uh, video is just a breakout of uh, uh, beyond a resistance level, which was right on dollar and five cents. And this happened about six or seven trading days ago. So share price or the chart in this case for Genus Plus looks pretty interesting. Last time share price was this high was in August last year. So we are talking about a six month high. Preferably I would like a one year high, but six months is pretty good. So we don't see much selling right now with Genus Plus. In fact, pretty good volume coming in. So more than likely this is a one fund manager, maybe two fund managers getting excited about Genus Plus. So definitely one to have on your watch list. A company I do own, Crisis Corporation. Uh, I don't think this company is profitable just yet. Main reason I took a position in this company is just the chart. Beautiful looking chart. Share price has gone not quite an all-time high. You can see the share price or this company listed in the middle of 2022. Share price went to $5.50 and then fell all the way back to $2.80. 
but beautiful uptrend right now. And you can just see the telltale signs of an uptrend. Share price goes up to a peak, then it pulls back, goes up to another peak, which is higher than the previous peak, then it drops back. That low is higher than the previous low. So we're looking at higher highs, higher lows. That's the definition of an uptrend. And the share price now has gone to another higher high. Uh, so beautiful uptrend developing for Crisis Corporation. Now, the market of this company is pretty high, 502 million. And in the last year, it had not much revenue, no income. It's just their technology. That's why the market is excited about this company. But just because I might be excited about that technology, just because the market might be excited about technology, doesn't mean the company is going to succeed. And the, re and the reason I'm just trading this is just because there is a big possibility this company may not succeed in the future. And if the share price keeps going up and up and up, it's okay. Uh, Downer EDI Limited. Uh, this company's had some really bad announcements in the past. 8th of December, share price dropped 20%. Uh, 27th of February, which would have been the half year full year results, share price dropped 23.7%. And even though those bar were bad results, share price has moved into an uptrend. And the share price has now gone beyond uh, what we saw the share price back in December before that previous bad announcement. So this is actually chart looking pretty good. Last time share price was this high was actually back in December last year. So I haven't really looked at this company in depth yet. Um, but possible, let's have a look at the weekly chart. And I'd say if you just go back through time, this would not be a high quality company. Just look at that. This is the sort of company you just trade for the short to medium term. And funny enough, if you just look at the, the P or the troughs in the share price, when the share price gets to say $3, just buy. This has happened over the last 20 years, just buy. And when the share price gets above, say, $7.50, sell. So the share price got to $3. In that last announcement, bad announcement, 27th of February. And then we see the share price pull back up to $4.11. So if you bought when the share price got to $3, guess what? You've made 33% on a downer EDI. Uh, next company is VGL, a company I've had on my watch list for a long, long time. Vista Group, they do they have um software and services, maybe not services, but just software for cinemas, stuff like that. Maybe not stuff like that, just cinemas. Uh, share price of this company got as high as, I think it was even higher before COVID. Yeah, look at that. Let's have a look at the weekly chart. I do remember this company being a bit of a hype stock before COVID-19. And the share price got as high as $5.50 and then a massive drop. In fact, the drop started before COVID-19. There was a one week where the share price dropped 26.5%. Uh, and then during COVID-19 or just after COVID-19, share price dropped all the way down to $1. Has had trouble, you know, um, recovering after that. But possibly this is a possible turn in or shift in center and a possible shift in the trend in the share price. But just be warned, if you go back to August last year, it looked like sentiment was trying to shift then as well. And that was sort of a false shift in sentiment. But this looks like it could be a little bit stronger. Now, if you have a look at volume, so the last time there was this possible shift in sentiment, volume was really low, which means there was not much um, strength behind that shift in sentiment. There was no reason why. It was just a little bit of lack of sellers at that point in time. And we have seen a bit of an increase in volume the last few days, which is telling me there are participants in the market getting a little bit excited about what they've seen with Vista Group's share price in the last few days. So definitely one to put on your watch list. Mark of this company is still $375 million. Um, so before COVID-19, we had this company had revenue of $138 million, was profitable, $10.4 million of profit. In the last year, revenue $125 million, but still not profitable. So this could be a bit of a turnaround story. Vista Group. Put that onto my watch list as well. A company I do own for the long term, will own for the long term, is EOL. And I am just thinking of taking or adding to my position. So the market of this company has fallen significantly. Right now, it's at $87.7 million. For a company that's profitable, and has really good growth in revenue. So revenue has grown from, say, less than $10 million to $32 million. Company have almost had almost $4 million of profit, and that should be growing over the next few years. This company is expanding as well uh, through Europe, that sort of area. Share price has dropped a lot. 
Um, so it's been caught up in this general tech sell-off, even though generally those companies have been sold off are unprofitable cash burning companies. You can't say the same thing about Energy One. And what excited me the last few training days is this high volume coming in. Really high volume when you look at the history behind this company. In fact, I'm trying to look at the last time you had this sort of volume. And you have to go all the way back to 2014, looks like. In fact, if you look at the weekly chart, Yeah, the last time we saw volume like this was 2014. What happened in 2014? We saw a breakout. This was a breakout. You can see very liquidly traded. And there was something exciting happening in 2014, which got the market excited. And that was a breakout for this company. And then in it wasn't one day volume. It was two days of pretty big volume. So obviously, there is maybe a fund manager who saw the share price, saw the valuation and went, ooh, I'm excited with the valuation of this company. So that's why I was thinking of taking or adding to my position in Energy One is just the volume. Always have a look at the volume. And it's a very important volume. And the reason I have a look at the volume is you want those fund managers taking positions in because they can add to their positions over long periods of time. And particularly for these smaller companies who might be a little bit more illiquid, you want these fund managers to get positions because they can drive the share price significantly higher over time. Not only that, you'll get people following these fund managers as well. So if a fund manager buys into a company, you'll get people who look at what the fund managers are buying and go, wow, this particular fund manager loves NG1. I'm going to take a position in this company. Uh, so that's the main reason I would even think about adding to my position in this company is just the volume. The chart, other than the volume, looks pretty ugly right now. And valuation, the other reason may be just valuation. Now on to Weebit Nano. This company's volatility has been insane. This, I would say, day traders absolutely love Weebit Nano right now. Uh, we have seen days where the share price has dropped 20.7%, days when the share price has risen 14%, Another one near yeah, 10%, um, 8.7%, but it's been the drops. So we've had drops of 20.2%, of, 10.3%, uh, 10 um, 18%, 18%, 11.4%. In the last three trend days or four trend, actually in this week, we saw the share price drop from, in fact, we'll have a look at the weekly chart for this. We saw the share price drop from around about, should we get the close of the previous week? $7.29 down to $5.70. $5 share price dropped 30% in the past week for WeBid Nano. And that is a problem with these types of companies. So if you don't know what WeBid Nano does, and to be honest with you, we're going to have to have a look what they do. They have, they're developing and commercializing something that's going to be big, they think. But the company has no profit, no rent, no. The company has no revenue, which means they definitely have no profit. But yet the company has a markup of 950 million. So it has been above $1 billion. So the reason why this company has a large markup is because of what they're doing. There are people in the market, people in out there who think this is the next big thing. But just have a look at Brainship. Just because uh, there's a bit of hype around this company, what they do doesn't mean they will succeed. Um, and I think just because day traders just love this company right now, I'm completely free. I won't even think about taking a position in this company, even if I do like what they do. And the other thing is just the volatility. The biggest down, the biggest, um, when you look at the up days and down days, it's the down days where we see big drops. Uh, the up days like 8 to 10%, but the down days upwards of 20%, which is telling me, that um, the selling is way more, you know, the selling pressure is way more powerful than the buying pressure, which tells me also if the share price falls below $4.50, which is the lows we saw back in March, there could be real problems for this company. And then the day traders will just get all out. And if the day traders try to get all out, you'll see a significant drop in share price. The other thing, I've already mentioned volume with Energy One, pretty high volume in the last three trading days. And that's another negative sign. I wouldn't be surprised to see another really big bounce up to say $7.50. And that's why the day traders are in there right now, thinking there will be a bounce. 
Magellan Financial Group. Oh, a nice little rally. Now, with Magellan Financial Group, I'm just following their funds and management, that sort of thing. But for some reason, the market likes Magellan Financial Group. Share price is trying to get out of its downtrend. And this is the most positive where I've been with Magellan since July 2021, when the share price was above $50. So share price now $9.49, even though there's been a little bit of rallies in the past, uh, really not exciting rallies. This is the first exciting possible rally we saw. And this is zoom in. We saw a nice little rally, and then we saw a dip in the share price on lower volume, and then another nice little rally in the share price on higher volume. So that's the other thing you want to see is when the share price rallies, you want to see good volume. When the share price pulls back, you want to see lower volume, which is telling you that there's not much selling pressure. So even though the share price went on a rally, there's not a lot of people out there who want to sell. And then when the share price starts to rally again, you see a higher volume, which means the market is excited about this company. So that's a good sign. And not only that, the share price, when it dipped, it dipped right to the moving average and then bounced off that. And the share price is right on the previous highs we saw last week. Now, there will be a lot of resistance moving forward for this company because of all the shareholders who bought higher prices in the past, but this is looking a little bit more exciting right now. Now, OFX Group is one company where the market got it completely wrong. You see, share price took a massive dive uh, over the last, well, not the last six months, between December 2022 and May 2023. Share price dropped from $2.80 all the way down to $1.38. And then the company released something on the 23rd of May, and it was good news. Share price rallied on the day by 20%. And this is exactly what you want to see after a good rally in the share price in one day. Share price just creeps on higher. And what this is doing was telling us is those shareholders who did buy in at higher prices in the last you know, six or eight months, uh, they their supply of shares is being met by demand. And we have seen pretty good volume as well, but a much higher volume than what we saw during the share price decline Um much higher volume. So this is a good sign moving forward for OFX Group, a company I've had it held in the past for a short to medium term trade. So in fact, I bought, yeah, there it is. I, so I bought there. And you can probably see why I bought there. I'm going to show you why. Because there it is. So I went above this little resistance level, bought there, share price retraced, tested that. Um, but it also was still in an uptrend at that point in time, and the share price kept going higher. And then I sold somewhere here, and then the share price dipped. So this is a possible interesting short-term play, possibly even medium-term play. Uh, link administration, share price down 13.9% on Friday. Uh, share price just keeps on falling. I've never done any work on this company, but share price of this company is in the long-term short-term down trade. Share price has fallen from $9 to $1.67. That $9 was in 2018. Uh, Mark cap of this company is $856 million. Revenue has been consistently dropping over the last four years. Not profitable. I can see definitely why the market is selling off. And then the share price dropped 13%. Why did it drop 13%? Let's have a look. Contract update. I'd say just by looking at the reaction from the market and the title of this announcement, they lost a contract or something. Uh, advises that its contract for the provision of fund administration services to Hester will not be renewed. Yep, that's why the market... Um, that's why the share price tanks. And the last time the share price was this low, maybe never. Never. Gee, this is an ugly looking chart. And this is another reason why, just because you see a really bad announcement, like this company released in December last year, share price fell 40% on this day. And we can see bad announcements after bad announcements just by looking at the chart here. So just because the share price drops a lot doesn't mean you should buy in. doesn't mean it's cheaper. It's good value because the company has just kept on releasing bad after bad announcements. And the share price now is at an all-time low. 
Drop sweet. Yes. So, <clears throat> so this is another, um, just like probiotic, another instance of a share price of a company a breaking out. And then he said share price pullback. So retest that breakout and then the share price taking off again. So we saw the breakout in April. We can see really good volume coming through. And that's exactly what you want to see. And the share price crept on higher up to about 32 and a half cents. And then we saw a little bit of pullback during June. Share price went as low as 25 and a half cents. Now that breakout level was around 25 cents. But if you look at it as a zone, the share price went back into that zone, that breakout zone, tested it to see if there's any more sellers. And there wasn't much sellers. And we know there wasn't much sellers. Look at the low volume, very low volume during that period when the share price pulled back. And then the last few trading days, we have seen, three days in fact, we have seen the share price go from 25 and a half cents back up to 30 and a half cents. And the last day, share price rose 10% on good volume. You can see some really good volume on those two big updates. So again, this is just a simple case of share price breaking up, a bit of a retest of the breakout and the share price taking off again. And we'll definitely want to see the share price get above about 32 and a half cents. So we want another uh, higher high. That's what we're looking for now for drop sweet suit. I had a guy associated with the company tell me that my first pronunciation of this company was right. But I don't know which pronunciation that was. Drop sweet. Or drop suit. Now I'm going to look at a few American ETFs or companies. The first one is ARK ETF, Innovation ETF, which if you look at the weekly chart, ugly, oh, weekly chart. Price of this ETF got as high as $160. Uh, if you don't know who Kathy Wood is, she runs this uh, fund or ETF, and she typically buys into innovative companies that are not profitable, burning through a lot of cash. And that's why the share price of this ETF fell like a rock. But in saying that, there is a little bit of hope right now with this ETF and a few companies that she does own or they do own in the portfolio. So we go to the old high and just do a line there. So the share price right now of this ETF is hovering around that high as we saw back in February. And if we get and get above that high, I think this could be um, not absolute confirmation that that's it. The bottom has been reached for ARK Innovation ETF. And if we have seen really low volume as well, in fact, dropping volume since March, which might be concerned. But if we do see the share price or the price of this ETF starting to move into an uptrend, you might see more interested parties taking positions in this particular ETF. Uh, a company I possibly will be taking a position in is Costco. It has broken out of a downtrend and not only has it broken out of the downtrend, the share price has taken off. And um, this company exists on really low gross margins, but that's okay. That's their moat. That's how they beat their competitors. Really low margins, give their customers really good deals. I have never been at a Costco shop, or maybe once, maybe once in America. Um, there's one to the north of me here in Brisbane. Uh, but uh, I think the main reason people go to Costco is they can buy bulk things at a real cheap price or discounted price. Now, this company has a market, pretty high market, $238 billion. If this was on the ASX, this would be the biggest company in Australia. And the last one is a company I've actually followed is Global E Online. This is a company that uh, facilitates e-commerce between countries or something like that. Uh, Global E Online engages in the provision of cross border e commerce solutions. Now, I put this onto my watch list a few years ago, uh, 2021, because I like what this company is doing. You just see the share price was a beautiful uptrend and it does look like this is a breakout in the share price. You can just see the old highs back in August. Share price got to these highs and then it just hovered, just hovered in this zone, which is the extra supply. Uh, because of psychology and the share price in the last few trading days has got, has taken off again. And I think this could be a bit of an out breakout for Global E Online. The valuation of this company is pretty high as well. $6.7 billion, but really good growth in revenue. Revenue has gone from $38 million 
to $409 million in five years, but this company is not profitable. So always keep that in the back of mind. When you do look at some of these tech companies in America, they're not profitable. I was, I was having a look at a company called Unity yesterday, a uh, company that is not profitable, but is generating cash in their operations. But one of the reasons they're not profitable is because of stock compensation to the employers, which I think per quarter could be something like, it's something ridiculous. Um, Unity, I'm not sure if you can see it here. It is software, probably can't. They have something like $150 million per quarter in stock compensation. And the um, shares on issue just keep on increasing. And that's why they're not profitable because they're paying out um, a lot of stock compensation and that does have a negative effect on profit. So they can be operating cash flow, free cash flow positive, but significantly unprofitable because of stock compensation. It, it is huge. This stock compensation is huge among tech companies in America. And I understand that is the way they attract, attract the best talent. You give those employees really good stock compensation and it does motivate those people to perform probably better. You give them motivation. You give them incentive to work the harder, to improve the company. Uh, but I think it's gone a little bit overboard. And that really came, really was noticeable when I looked at Unity Software's financials. Just the amount of stock compensation was absolutely ridiculous. I think they also potentially, don't quote me on this, potentially capitalize their research and development, which will also improve their operating cash flow, but will have a negative effect on their profit because of amortization and depreciation, that sort of thing. Anyway, that's all I've got for these technical updates. Probably gone on a little bit longer than I expected. If you have any questions, any thoughts, there's my microphone, it's in, it's been in the shot wall. If you have any questions, any thoughts, just leave them in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I am not a financial advisor. If you do need financial advice, make sure you seek out someone who is qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.